Good morning. Good morning to, uh, to you and to our Midland campus, and it's good to be with you this morning. Well, it's just good to be with you. It was kind of interesting waking up in the middle of the night with rain, wasn't it? And that kind of like, what is that? And then uh, you keep thinking, is my house dried out so much that now everything is going to leak? I don't know if anybody else kind of had some of those issues, but so it's going to be a little bit different here this morning. Um, technically... We are, well, not technically, we really are, um, at the end of our study of experiencing God. Some of you are new and haven't been a part of that. Um, some of you have been going through the Experiencing God study since day one. Uh, some of you have just started the study. Some of you are still in a group. You know, I can go through, all, and I'm getting a cough drop ready here. Sorry about that. Um, so we've been going through this whole study. And first time I did the study was back in the, early 90s. Uh, It was like 92, 93, I think, something like that, just the other day um, when I went through that study. And and I've gone through it probably, I don't know, four or five times uh, since that time. So I've got nearly a quarter of a century of walking through this study. And what I wanted to do, and I was going to do this last week, but instead just felt like the Lord wanted us to press into the issue of um, womanhood. But I wanted to just pause with you and do what I did a few weeks ago and and finish this list of, um, I guess I don't have a title for it, I guess I'd call it the list of, hey, be aware of this after the study, okay? It's um, six things that I think you need to keep in the back of your mind after you come off of a study like Experiencing God where God has seemed more real to you than he has before. Now, let me throw another caveat in there or Um, another wrench, whatever analogy you like. You may not have done the Experience in God study, and so you're like, well, this isn't going to matter to me. So let me put it another way. There's probably going to come a season in your life where God's going to be more real than he's ever been before. Uh, I I shared with you weeks ago about how we used to call that a revival, when you go to revival services, and, and you have this great experience of God. No one ever talks about how you prepare for the Post experience. What do you do when it do when he doesn't feel close? What do you do when you're not that excited? Um, it's like at the end. I did a wedding last night. It's like at the end of weddings when the bride and groom leaves. You know, and I, I say it's my privilege to introduce to you for the first time, Mr. and Mrs. So and So. You know, and everybody's like, "Woo, that's great!" And they walk out and they're gonna go, you know, have a party, whatever. And before I dismiss the crowd. <clears throat> I say, listen, I would want to encourage all of you to be praying for this young couple. They're really excited today. But in about 24 hours, they're going to wonder who said this was a good idea, okay? And, and, and they're going to discover things about each other they've never discovered. And, and they're going to realize that there, there is a difference in the way people squeeze toothpaste. And the, you know, they're just going to, you understand what I'm talking about? I mean, you have these great experiences. And then all of a sudden, there's like, wait a minute. Nobody told me that. So I've done this study, like I said, over the last 25 years, probably, I don't know, many times. And I've compiled a list that I want to put in front of you for you to sort of file away for when the experience isn't as rich as it has been. And if you haven't been going through it, file it away for later on when you have an experience with God and then the experience is not as rich as it used to be. Um, And if you're a student getting ready to go to camp with us, you need to file this away because you're probably going to have a great experience of God at camp, and then you're going to come home, and it's not going to be the same great experience, okay? So, second little thing I want you to be aware of. I got six things I'm getting ready to go through, okay? I haven't made it through six points in probably 15 years on a Sunday morning. So there's a huge over and under bet going on back there in the tech area, if you want to know... But here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to close my Bible, but that's so I can explain something to you. As we go through these six, and they're going to come up on the screen, every one of them are going to have various scriptures with them, okay? Probably not going to look up any of them, because I want you to get all of them. So you, you might leave here this morning on all campuses, and you could justifiably say, we never even opened our Bible, Okay? Like I've heard that about churches where they don't even use the Bible. We're going to use the Bible 
but we may not open it today, okay? So please do not walk out of here and go, I knew they didn't believe in the Bible. We're, no, really, seriously, I, I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. Hopefully you'll go back and look at it. You, are you with me? Everybody follow? Good? Okay. I hope so, because we're going to do this. Okay, here's the first one. Number one, an experiencing God lifestyle, and every single one of them are going to start with that phrase, okay, if you're a note taker. An experiencing God lifestyle always passes through seasons of uncertainty and dryness that require the practiced lifestyle of abiding. Pretty long statement. You know, if I were taking notes, I'd probably say, get ready for seasons of um, uncertainty and dryness or something like that. So the experiencing God lifestyle, if you're going to, you might even think of it this way. If you're going to keep walking with God for your entire life, you're going to spend prolonged seasons that seem very dry, but they're going to require, as it says in the, in the note there, this lifestyle of just abiding. Let me give you another two words for abiding. Staying put. Okay, and then you see John chapter 15 on the screen. Now, John chapter 15 is this whole story where Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And, and, and as he goes through that, he says, you have to abide in me. He who abides in me bears much fruit. And that whole idea of abiding is this intertwining of the person you're supposed to be doing life with. And you have to stay connected. And you have to stay pressed in. And you've got to keep pursuing. And you can't walk away. And you've got to keep obeying. You, you got to keep pressing in. But just so you see more of the certainty of this, there are going to be seasons, and living out here sort of helps you see this a little bit differently. There are going to be seasons where you're going to be literally praying for God to reign in your life because it's so dry. And that doesn't mean there's something wrong. Okay, so let me give you a little thing to remember. If you sense that the heavens are silent, let me pause for just a minute, time out. How many of you would say in my lifetime, Midland, you participate and I'll, like, I'll, I'll mentally like feel you. How many of you would say you have experienced the faithfulness of God through seriously dry seasons? Would you raise your hand? Hey, look around you, look around you, Okay. I'm not saying that so I, I can say, see, I told you. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying the more you walk with Jesus, the more you're going to walk through the desert. Okay, it, it's not always going to be as Cheyenne was talking about the Amazon. And there's either, this is very narrow, but there's one of two things happening. One, you're walking in sin and you need to confess that and repent and return. You could write down Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts 3, 19 says, repent and return so that times of refreshing might come. That's one thing. But you may sit down and you may say that you're doing everything I'm going to talk about in point number two. You are loving Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. For the life of you, you cannot think of an area of disobedience. And if that's the case... Then the second thing is what's critically important for you, and it's nothing new, but it's just a reminder building on number one, and it's this. An experiencing God lifestyle never graduates from the basics, period. No magic books, no magic programs, just the basics done well and grown and matured in. And you see all the scriptures. Psalm 119, 11 and 105, you probably memorized those in vacation Bible school about how can a young man keep his way pure by keeping it according to your word. Your word, Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The, the second Timothy passage that God's word is inspired and it's profitable for reproof and correction and training and righteousness so you and I might be perfect and complete for every good work that God wants to do in our lives. Philippians that talks about in every situation, pour out your heart towards God and let the peace of God Guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. 
You remember the story I told you several weeks ago about the baseball player? Some of you weren't here. I told you the story about the baseball player who came to me and his batting average was in the toilet, basically, and, and he shouldn't have even been in the lineup. And now all of a sudden, he's batting over 400. And I would like to say that the reason that all changed is because he came to see me and I said, bless you. And that, that's not what happened. I asked him, I said, how did it change? Actually, I didn't wait for him to answer. I asked him, if you remember the story, I said, did you go to the batting cages? Did you work off the tee? Did you take um, soft toss and all these things? He said, yes. I did all the basics and kept practicing and kept practicing. The same is true in your life of abiding. Here's what we do. We try to get Jesus hits, Jesus moments, rather than living in the Jesus lifestyle. And so we'll switch churches because that church bores us now or that preacher or we don't like that. So maybe there's someplace else we need to go. Or we'll go find a new Christian book. Or maybe it's the translation of the Bible I'm using. And some of these things it could be. Some of these things it's probably not. Maybe I need a new devotional book. Maybe I need something. Rather than just realizing there are seasons in your experience of God where whether you feel like it or not, you're just going to have to read God's word and trust that he's faithful. In fact, I said this at the end of this service, first service. I'll say it right now on this one. There are going to be seasons when about the only thing you can pray and know that it's how you're supposed to pray is the following. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know how it goes? Could you finish it? Because I'm going to tell you something. There are going to be seasons when you can't even pray because you don't know what to pray. There are going to be seasons where you've prayed for the miracle and you're not seeing the miracle the way you wanted to see the miracle. There are going to be seasons where God's not going to make one whit of sense. That's encouraging. And this is a really encouraging message. There are going to be seasons when no one in the church is going to be trustworthy to you. There are going to be seasons when it is absolutely unfair. And those seasons are probably going to be followed by what you consider to be the best season of your life. And it's a season that God somehow in his providence and his wonder is going to walk you in to teach you something else about yourself and something else about him. And you've got to stick to the basics. You've got to be in the word. You've got to be in prayer. There's not going to be some magic answer nobody's ever thought of. It's just the reality. Here's the third thing. An experiencing God lifestyle always requires real practical effort. In other words, sometimes it's hard. Now, I've given you three passages of scripture there. The one I want to talk about is in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is the telling of the feeding of the 5,000, which is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, But I love the way John tells the story. Because there's this little part where where Jesus tells them to go and seat all the people. And he says, put them in groups of 50 and hundreds. In other words, go do something and organize it, okay? That, that's what he says. So I, let me read this quote to you, and then I'll say something that could cost me my job. I'm going to read this whole paragraph I kind of wrote here. Oftentimes we look for and want the miracle without the life of effort. Remember number two above about sticking with the basics? Oftentimes we want the miracle, but we don't want to live the life that precedes the miracle. The idea of making adjustments in our lives, like the study has been teaching us, and obeying what we sense the Lord is telling us or what we know the Lord is telling us and has told us to do. All this takes effort. Sometimes the Red Sea will part. Remember the Red Sea? You know, the whole parting of the Red Sea for the children of Israel, right? Remember that? Yeah. Sometimes it will part. As a matter of fact, if you go back and read the story in Exodus, the Lord says this. I'm paraphrasing it, but you'll see it if you go back and read it. He says, hey, Moses, why are you talking to me? Start walking. It's pretty interesting. Sometimes the Red Sea will part, but more often than not, you and I are just going to have to build a bridge of obedience over the Red Sea. I'll finish it. In other words, this lifestyle never becomes natural. That's why it's called fighting the fight of faith. Some of us, here's the statement 
my job losing statement because it can be taken out of context. Some of you may need to stop praying and just start doing something. Start obeying. Start serving. Uh, start loving. Start giving. Start doing. I almost feel like sometimes the Lord might even in his divine way say, I've stopped listening. Why don't you start doing? And it's this whole idea of, well, it's, it's sort of like people who want to take a pill to lose weight but don't think you have to do the basics of diet and exercise. Does that make any sense? I know it does. And, and, and so it's the same thing in your life of walking with Jesus. It's going to require some effort. There are going to be days you're going to say to yourself, I don't want to love anybody. But guess what you have to do? You just got to choose to love, right? I don't want to be nice. But you have to do what? Nobody's answering because you know the answer. Um, there are going to be days you're going to wake up and go on a Sunday morning. I don't want to go serve kids. So you just go serve. There's like only one area of our lives where we, where we do this consistently, and that's when you wake up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, sometimes Saturday and Sunday, and you got to go to work. And there are days you just say, I don't want to go to work. But there's a pretty good chance you do what? You go to work. And, and that's just what you do, because you know to go to work, you go to work to go get paid, however well or good that is. Because that's what you're supposed to do. Because that's the basics. And if your parents and your kids complain about it, oh, rah, 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 you say, that's what we do. We go to work. I don't care if you like it or not, right? You're, I mean, that's just what we do. We work. I don't love what I do. Well, I don't love you all the time. So whatever it might be, all of a sudden you start talking about Jesus and everybody wants it to feel right. Your feelings are irrelevant. When it comes to obedience, sometimes you just got to obey and the Lord will probably bless your feelings in return. So we're not going to all walk around and go into the lobby and say, I don't feel like loving you, but I want you to know I love you. I ain't, I don't feel like greeting today, but I'm glad you're here. That's not what we're talking about. You know what we're talking about. An experience will sometimes leave us a certain way, a lifestyle demands consistency and effort. And sometimes you just got to get up and do it again. And, and that's why you need friends sometimes to help you because it just gets really hard. If someone's told you that walking with Jesus just gets sweeter every day, that's probably not true. It eventually is sweeter after days but some days are not sweeter than the day before. It's a great little hymn. There are some days just aren't that sweet. But he's faithful. He is faithful. And if I could say this, many of us have tried the alternative. In other words, there are many of you who have been believers and followers of Jesus for a long time. And you can even remember seasons in your life where you said to Jesus, I'm so done with you. I'm so finished with this thing. And yet, he just keeps coming back. And he's faithful. Number four. An experiencing God lifestyle is always seeking out ways to serve and to sacrifice for the good of others and the glory of God. An experiencing God lifestyle is always seeking out ways to serve and sacrifice for the good of others and the glory of God. Here's what I wrote in my notes. Self-centeredness is usually a pretty good sign that you're not experiencing God. If someone tells me they're going through a dry season in their walk with the Lord, one of the first questions I'm going to ask them is about their walk in the basics. A second thing I'm going to ask them is if they're serving someone outside of their family. Are you serving? Are you serving the least of these? Are you serving people? Are, are you just, are you spending your life in the service of others? Because if you're not spending your life in the service of others, 
The reason is you're either being completely disobedient or completely selfish, which are usually two sides of the same coin. Because to experience God is going to require the sacrifice of service everywhere. You know, the reason we ask you to serve in student ministry and children's ministry, we ask you to serve greeting people at the door uh, or whatever that is, we're not asking you to serve because that's what the church does. Here, here's really our core belief. We believe we're supposed to help you grow in an attitude of service so that when you leave here, you live a lifestyle of service. That's really what it is. I mean, we, we're a one day a week gig for you. We want you to show up and learn to serve children, even though you raised yours already. We want you to serve those who are students. We want you to serve people by greeting them and making coffee for them and doing different things on mission trips, whatever it is. We want you to learn to serve in this environment so when you get out there, you're serving people. If you find yourself pushing away from service to other people, there's a good chance your experience of God is drying up pretty good. Number five, an experiencing God lifestyle is burdened by an ever-growing, God-centered, holistic compassion for people. Let's take a look at that. An experiencing God lifestyle is burdened by an ever-growing, God-centered, holistic compassion for people. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, Whatever I do, I do it so people can see Jesus. I don't want to put any stumbling block in front of Jesus. Matthew chapter 14, 14, he, he sees people and he's a, he's a shepherd who sees people as sheep without a shepherd. Now listen, um, like the rest of you, and we joke about it, I know we joke about it, but you don't joke about things all the time unless they're real all the time. And for those of us who've lived here the longest, we joke about how people are driving us crazy. Someone sent me a text the other day, they were at a, a discount tire, okay, 30 minutes before the store opened, and there was a line all the way to the street. And this person said, really? And then, you know, what's become a sarcastic remark in our church, no neutral moments, which half the people who use it are like, I wish this was not true, because I don't want to be nice to anybody right here. And you all know what it's like. Um, well, I'll tell you when this hit me. I'll just change this story. I had to go to Walmart the other night at like 1030, okay? Have you ever had one of those nights? Yeah, you have. Um, and it was a petty issue. We'd run out of coffee, okay? So, you know, I was getting ready to make coffee for the morning, you know, with the thing coming on so I could wake up and, and drink life. And so I'm getting ready to make it, and I realized, well, I made coffee. What was your problem, woman? How come you didn't buy coffee? You know, I'm, I'm doing all the godly things you're supposed to do. And um, so, and I, you know, she's like, well, maybe you're not supposed to have coffee in the morning. I'm like, Get behind me. Say, I mean, so I, all, the, all these things. So I'm like, I don't want to do it. I'll just go to Walmart. Nobody will be there. Ha, 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 ha. It was full. It's 1030 at night. And, and I'm just going to shoot straight with you. By the time I walked out of there, I was almost in tears. Because of moms with their babies. Families who you could look on their faces and see that they were absolutely worn out. Shelves that were empty. Workers who were going crazy. Now, the good part about the trip, here's the good part about the trip. There's this particular kind of yogurt that I like that I never can find in Midland, and it's a pumpkin-flavored yogurt. And I found, it was there, I was like, glory. I mean, I was like, there's a reason I was out of coffee. And I bought like the shelf, okay? And I show up, and, the, and it's the manager of the entire store who's checking me out. He's, you can see on his face, he's like, I'm about to blow up. And he drops one of them, busts it. And I said, well, you better replace that. I didn't say that. I, <laughs> he said, he said oh, let me replace it. I said, dude, it's cool, man. No worries. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And it, all I know is, I'm not telling you I'm the perfect example. I just know the more you press into Jesus, the more he's going to put people in front of you to say, do you see people the way I see them. Are you walking around complaining about them? 
Are you walking around yelling about them? Are you honking at them? Or are you seeing that I'm bringing the world to you and they're broken and battered and they need to know if somebody loves them? An experiencing God lifestyle that's not marked by a brokenness over people that are sheep without a shepherd is a hypocrite. It's a dead church. And so this, this idea that you could be experiencing God but not be burdened, and it's a, I know that's an old church word. This, it's heavy on you. Listen, some of you, the reason God may have you in the Permian Basin is he's trying to teach you what it is for it not to be about you. Because everything else has been. And now he's got you in this place where he's saying, look, I don't care if you like it. I don't care if you think it's pretty. I don't care if you like your job. Do you love me and do you love people? You, re you do realize that's more important to him than your job. And silence. Is it this quiet in Midland? That's the truth. As a friend of mine used to say, it's not about your happiness. It's about your holiness. First. First. And an experiencing God church is a church that cannot shake the fact that people are drowning. They are, they are worn out. And a church and a people of that church to say they've experienced God, have got to be so burdened about it that it shakes who we are, it shakes what we do, it shakes how we talk, rather than the opposite, and it's shaping us in a negative way. Number six, an experiencing God lifestyle is always being confronted with easily solidified personal predispositions. It's a pretty fancy statement. Another way of saying it is, it's always bumping up against what I see, want, or think I deserve. Now, I've given you a couple of passages of Scripture there. Let me just tell you the story in Acts chapter 10 and 11. You might know the story. So Jesus has been crucified. He has risen. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father, Acts chapter 1. You get to uh, Paul. He was Saul, named Paul, in not chapters 8 and 9. As soon as he gets saved, many of you don't know this, Paul the Apostle kind of goes into exile, okay? The story turns to Peter, okay? Same Peter who cut a guy's ear off, denied Jesus three times and all that. God's going to use him in some amazing ways. <clears throat> so Peter is hanging out at a dude's house. I'm paraphrasing the story, but it's totally true. He's hanging out at a dude's house, and he's, he's basically hanging out on a balcony, and, and he falls asleep, okay? Got the story? past all my distractions. And so he's hanging out on a balcony. He goes to sleep. He has a dream. In the dream, uh, like a, he calls it a sheet, a big sheet comes out of the sky. And basically, it's filled with pork and pork byproducts, okay? It's, or other things that are, a Jew could not eat, okay? So, um, so this whole sheet comes down, and this person in the dream says to Peter, kill and eat, Okay? kill and eat. And Peter's like, nope, I've never done that. That's never touched my lips. I'm not going to do that. Happens three times in the dream. And finally, <laughs> in the dream, the Lord says, what I have changed and made clean, don't you dare call unclean. Now, while this is going on, and you may not know this story, so while this is going on with Peter on the deck tanning and he has a dream, there's an Italian dude named Cornelius, okay? He's a Gentile, and I'm not trying to be racist or anything here, but base, back then, basically, it was Jews and Gentiles, God people and not God people. And Peter still didn't think those not God people deserved God, okay? That's the short way of saying it. And so Cornelius has a dream. So the Italian, in his dream, is told there's a guy he's supposed to go get who's supposed to tell them what they need. Are you following the story? Okay, so Cornelius, the, the godfather, sends his people to go get Peter. And Peter's like, he doesn't know what to do. Some dudes knock on the door. They said, hey, the Godfather wants to see you. So however that goes down. And, and Peter's like, I'm going to go. So Peter goes to see the Godfather and, and says to the Godfather, have I got a deal that you can't refuse? I'm just making that up. But anyways, he leads this entire 
family to Jesus. And when he shows up, here's what he tells me. He, he basically says it this way. You know, I've never hung out with people like you. In fact, I wouldn't even dare eat with people like you. In fact, I didn't think people like you deserved God. Now, you can go back and read it. Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. These people did not associate. Sort of like people from Midland and Odessa used to not associate. Sort of like people of different races didn't associate. And now all of a sudden, God is confronting this hardened lifestyle and opinion of Peter. Let me tell you something. <coughs> I told a friend of mine this the other day, because we were just having a debate. And I said, I believe a lot less than what I used to believe. But the few things that I really believe, I really believe. In other words, there are some things you used to think were worth dying for. And now you're realizing there's fewer and fewer bridges to die on, but there's more and more people to die for. And we sometimes hold these opinions and hold these convictions and things so tight and we miss people. We miss what God's doing in the lives of people. We hold traditions sacred. And we miss what God might be doing in his church. You understand what I'm saying? So all I'm telling you is, is you're experiencing God and you're walking with him. I'm going to say this in a way that it's going to offend, I think. But I, I think you, you catch the spirit of what I'm trying to communicate to you enough that you know what I'm talking about. It's going to feel like seasons in your life that God won't stop jacking around with you. There's going to be seasons in your life where you're just going to feel like he won't stop tinkering. And you just want to say, dude, stop. Can we, let's just do Happyville, okay? Let's, let's, let's just do it's all good. And it's in those times when you're, you're about to lose it. You're about to lose hope. You're about to say, I'm done. We're in the stillness of the moment, in a still, quiet voice, in a time and a place when you would have never expected it. His still, small voice reminds you, I love you. And I'm working on things the way you can't see them. And I'm going to change you, and I'm going to change people around you. Let me tell you, man, when you think you've got him figured out, you think you got this Christian thing figured out? Oh, dude, you better be careful. You just better be careful, okay? Because he's big. And um, he runs the show. And you know what? I, I hate that statement. I really do. That statement that God controls everything. You know, it's comforting, but it's also kind of irritating. Does that make sense? You know what I'm talking about? You ever had something happen in your life and people say, well, you know what? God's running the show. And you want to go, does that mean if I hit you right now that God's running the show? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Amen, brother. Bam. <laughs> I said it three points ago. Sometimes all you're left with is my Father in heaven, you're holy. I need you to give me today what I need. I need you to help me to forgive people the same way you've forgiven me. Oh, my word, I need help with temptation. And I am reminded, yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory. And when it's all said and done, you and I will be able to say, without any reservation, he's faithful. He's just faithful faithful. Let's pray together. So whether you're in Midland or Odessa, if you need someone to pray with you after the services, you know you can come to the front. We'd love to spend that time with you. Father, thanks for this day. Um, I hope that what I've tried to teach this morning has been seen as practical advice, not pessimistic advice. Lord, walking with you is the hope of our lives. 
But sometimes it's the most difficult time of our lives because life's just hard sometimes. And so my prayer is that the people we live with and do life with and do struggles with, we would all see in each other a desire to walk with you and to experience you and teach us to love you and to love people. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great afternoon. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Remember to get some prayer bracelets out front for students and leaders at camp.